following you hear from Isaiah the 40th chapter comfort comfort my people says your God speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended that her iniquity is pardoned that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins a voice cried in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry, and I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, Herald of good news, lift it up, fear not, say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd, he will gather the lambs in his arms, he will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And now we pray responsibly from Psalm 85. Lord, you are favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sins. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. His salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the skies. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We hear the epistle from Peter's second epistle, the third chapter. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him. 
him without spot or blemish and at peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the Alleluia and the Gospel.
meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Amen. You may be seated. Grace and mercy and peace be unto all of you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Be redeemed in Christ. Last night on television I saw the episode Finding Minnesota. You ever seen that? Well, they had the uh, they had some people that would go on the trails and stomp with uh, snowshoes. So they stomp a path through the woods in the city's area, and that would prepare the way for them to ride their bicycles, okay, with wider tires. So not just riding in the summertime, when most of us would ride a bike, but being able to ride them in the wintertime in the snow. But these people were stomping down the path to prepare the way uh, for those bicycles. And so I thought about, I thought about what it means to prepare the way in a much greater significance, with much greater meaning, when you think about preparing for Christmas, preparing for the Christ. And that that's the role that John the Baptizer played, a very important role. I was told about uh, a graduation service that was being held at Duke University. And uh, the speaker, who happened to be Lee Iacocca, who uh, took over the Chrysler Corporation, he said to the graduates sitting there, you know, the only thing standing between you and your diploma today is me as the speaker. And so, you know, that's what we think about uh, when we ponder what Christmas means and the message of Christ coming into our world. Really, when you think about it, the thing standing between us and Christ is the person of John and his message, okay? Preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. There is that famous painting, you know, of John with that bony finger. He's got it up, and he's pointing away from himself, and he's pointing to Jesus. As the evangelist John, he uh, captures that so clearly when he records the words of John the baptizer, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what John did when he saw Jesus walking by. And that's what he does for us in this season. He points the finger to Jesus away from himself. He knows his role. He must decrease and Christ must increase. And so he's willing to step out of the way, out of the limelight, and put Jesus front and center. And that's his mission. That's his purpose. If only we could understand our role, right? As husbands and wives, as parents and grandparents, as pastor and teachers, whatever we do, as our vocation in Christ, we are pointing people to Jesus that Christ is at the center of everything, that he's at the center of our lives and he's in the center of our hearts, and that there is no rival to be found there, that Christ is all in all. I don't know if you can notice or not, but I didn't shave this morning. I've got some whiskers here. And uh, I did it for a reason. I wasn't just being lazy. I didn't sleep in late. Uh, but I just left the razor alone today and uh, wanted to uh, maybe identify with John the Baptizer a little bit more. I've got, okay, I've got a nice white robe on here. Well, I always wear that, but he had a camel, a coat of camel hair. So I couldn't, uh, 
I couldn't reduplicate that, I guess, but I didn't shave. I didn't think that John would be shaving every day out there in the desert. But it makes somebody kind of unique, doesn't it? Something uh, out of the ordinary to kind of capture our attention. And that's what certainly John does because he's known for eating grasshoppers. I looked up locust in my dictionary and it says see insects. See the insect portion. So I went to the insect and yes, it's a grasshopper that he was eating and honey. That was his diet. Yes, he's kind of a out of the way guy. Not the guy that you would uh, most normally think that God would use. But it's his voice, it's his person that had been prophesied long before. Isaiah prophesied, I send my messenger ahead of you. Yes, and he will baptize, and he will preach a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. The voice of one calling in the desert, he's located specifically as being in the desert. People from Judea and people from the city of Jerusalem, they came out to hear John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Did you go out there to just see, uh, you know, to hear what you want to hear? Whatever may be the, the latest uh, trend in political and religious thinking? No, you went out to see a prophet, and that's what you heard when you heard John. Who warned you to flee? You know, he called them vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath of God? And then he came with that message, repent. Repentance. You know, God did a lot of things in the desert, didn't he? And he continues with John. He he led his people through the desert. After uh, bringing them out of exile, bringing them out of slavery in Egypt, they exiled in the desert for 40 years. He fed them in the desert. He took care of them in the desert. He demonstrated his power while in the desert. And yes, it's when we find ourselves in the desert that we also see the importance of John's word and John's message. Prepare the way of the Lord. You know, we are really in a desert as we listen to our media and we listen to what is going on in our world. Uh, we've been inundated uh, with accounts of uh, sexual uh, misconduct by politicians, <clears throat> Uh, by entertainers, by people of high profile. And I think that we're all sort of in a frenzy. I think we're finding ourselves in a national desert because we realize that there is a lot that's not right. There's a lot that's broken. And there's a lot of hypocrisy with all of us. Not that we are standing with a self-righteous attitude as if we are perfect, but we realize that there is a problem with all of us. And, you know, you think about a message of repentance. You think about John's message and calling people to repentance. You know, people can say, oh, I'm, they can say I'm embarrassed or I'm ashamed or I'm sorry. <laughs> When people get caught, then they can say those kinds of things. But to have a spirit of repentance means more than just refraining from doing certain things or trying to do positive things, but it's having a change of mind, a change of heart. That's what repentance is in the biblical understanding. And that's what John is proclaiming. And that's what the church proclaims that we are all in need of repentance. And sometimes, being in the desert of our culture, we see the importance of it more so than ever. 
And it's an opportunity, isn't it? To speak that message and for it to resonate among people. That yes, we are all sinners in need of repentance. And unless we understand that message, we will not receive the coming of Christ. His word and message will not find a place in our hearts. You know, we see that this message of John is very much law, which brings with it condemnation, which brings with it, you know, fear of punishment. And we don't like, we don't like that message of law, do we? But, you know, the Bible talks about the law as being the schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. And when we see and recognize our lost condition, then we are able to take that child born in Bethlehem, put him in our arms and hold him close, and know that he is the one who covers our sin. And he is the one who is able to give us that spirit of continuing repentance. But that's a daily part of our life. In fact, Martin Luther talks about the significance of our baptism, in that we would daily die and drown the old Adam that's within us, and that the new man would daily emerge and rise and live before God in righteousness and holiness forever. John was known for baptizing in the desert, in the Jordan River. And they were confessing their sins in connection with that act of baptism. And so he was preparing the way for the Christ. Just as you and I have been baptized into the name of the triune God, we are preparing for his next coming by being baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it takes something out of the ordinary to sometimes shake us up, right? And get our attention. But that's what John is all about. And his coming, his message had been prophesied long before he arrived on the scene. He knew his role, and he knew that he himself was not worthy to untie the sandal shoes of the one who would come after him, namely the Christ. Yes, I remember hearing a five-year-old child speak to his parents, and uh, the parents uh assuring him that they love him. And uh, they asked him, how do you know that we love you? And he said, because you baptized me. Because you baptized me. Wow. That's a pretty profound answer coming from a very young person. Baptized into Christ. It is a life of repentance. It is a daily drowning <coughs> of the old man that's within us. And the new, the new man emerging and arising before God to live in holiness and purity forever. The story is told about a quarterback who uh, won one of the bowl games. His team won the bowl game. He was getting all kinds of accolades, you know, for that win. And he set a lot of records. And in the midst of his interview, he said, well, you know, you think I'm good. You just wait till my brother comes. He's great. He's better than I am. And so, yeah, when he came three years later, they won the conference and did greater things. But it's kind of like this, uh, this message of John. There comes one after me who is greater than me. And that's what this season is all about. If 
we are prepared to receive the greater one who is coming. May John's message continue to resound in your mind and in your heart. And yes, be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever, world without end. Amen. And may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.